I was actually surprised that I thought we were in late, but I'm wrong. Well, um, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I went to an all boys middle school, and uh, which was awesome. Anytime you hear like all boys school, that must be like, so, but uh, whenever a teacher would walk in, every every all the boys would stand up, and just like in a movie from like the fifties and forties, they would say like, "Good, good morning, Mr. Smith," or and it was really, really respectful, and it was really awesome. And, and the best thing about an all boys school it was that normally you yeah, have like uniforms, ours were like a navy blue shirt and black pants, so it was great every day. So that's an aside. We're not going to stand up and say hello, sorry. Well, I think everyone that walks <laughs> in, <laughs> if we don't know their name. Hello, Mr. Spivey. Yeah. <laughs> I, just anybody that walks in the door. Oh, like, Captain, my Captain. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Very much, very much like that. Um, my name is Ken Spivey. Uh, I play in the Ken Spivey band. It's a uh, steampunk Doctor Who band. I also uh, run the largest Doctor Who convention in Florida, Time Lord Fest. And I own the largest Doctor Who Facebook page, the Doctor Who Hub. And uh, the, the lovely track director, Jennifer, uh, is kind enough because normally I don't get to pick topics for panels. And I'm always over in the Hooniverse. And I do love Stargate quite a bit. So she sent me an email and said, what panels would you like to do? And I just presented her like with four panels. I said, these sound good. She goes, OK, you can do all four. I went, yes. So the reason why we're doing this panel is it's purposely controversial. It's religion in Stargate discussing religion. Awesome. I want this to be a debate. Like, like if, if it gets heated, we've done the right thing. <laughs> so, would you like to introduce yourself and your life? I am Heather McMurray. I am an editor. I have a master's degree in religions and Western antiquity. Um, uh, like Daniel, I speak or read lots and lots of languages. Uh, Middle Egyptian, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Moabite, Ammonite. Um, all of them are dead. Um, yeah, I don't speak anything useful. And um, I have a half of a PhD in Hebrew Bible. I quit before comps and dissertation because like, I wanted to make money. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, and uh, I, like I said, I'm an editor, so I edit uh, nonfiction uh, reference type books. I quit one semester before I finished my master's in Roman history, so I quit because all of my friends were poor when they graduated, and yeah. I wanted money. So yeah, yeah money is important. <laughs> so. I'm Jamie Poff. I'm the assistant director for Stargate Multiverse Track, and I'm basically here to chime in when I know a little something, so I'm more like everyone else out there that discusses religion in sci-fi. Um, so I don't really have any awesome credentials other than that I'm the track director and I get to be here, so hooray. So I'll chime in from time to time and offer what, what little bit I can, but I think it's a great topic and I think it's one that needs to be addressed. We always tend to skirt away from it because, oh, you don't talk about religion, but religion is a huge part of Stargate. And so we, we probably need to have a chat about it. And like he said, if uh, someone's not getting offended, my, my motto has always been, if you don't offend someone with your actions or what you say, you probably haven't accomplished anything in that regard either. Um, because that's just the way that it is when you talk about religion. So. Well, that, and, and if, if I've offended someone, also I, I failed in uh, speaking clearly, actually, mm -hmm. because my intent is not to offend. And if I did offend, I have failed as a presenter. Right. So uh, please let me know. Everyone should be able to go get coffee afterwards and shake hands, basically, is yeah, my that's, motto. That's a good yeah. Thing. Yeah, cool with them. And hopefully start a new religion. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna tell you how in three easy steps. Okay. Get all of your yeah. Yeah, like, like write some sci fi novels. <laughs> and sell some treatments. Yeah. So uh I guess, one species to fall to? So, um, there you go, just start the topic. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> what made me think of this is that I, we've all done it before. Uh, at least I think we all. Uh, we've watched Xena, right? Yeah. Xena, if you watch from beginning to end, could not be any more irreverent to religions. 
Every religion. Oh my gosh. Even Christianity. They're like, they're like Mary and Joseph walk by with a baby. They're like, like we're looking for a manger. Like, yeah. And it was like, whoa. They just pee peed on Christianity. And it was just like a, a side thing. And, and then the show ends and they go to the East and, and mess with their religions. And, not a, and one episode was so offensive, they put a disclaimer at the beginning saying, Really sorry, anybody who uh, uh, believes in Rishma or any Eastern deity. Or if you watch Sanctuary, you can find out that, that Kali is actually a giant spider that lives below the ocean and controls the, the tectonic plates. Like, well, I guess that religion's a giant spider now. Uh, <laughs> wow. But Stargate actually treats most religions... Most living religions. Most living religions with respect. The older ones that are not as practiced are open to being uh, a, a set of beliefs in an entire science fiction system, while living ones are treated with a great deal of respect, which, thank goodness, because it would be the last few seasons would be odd if they didn't do that. <laughs> and I actually, uh, she has so many more credentials than I do at this, I'd like to turn the discussion right over to you. Compare and contrast the treatment of, if you could, the Egyptian deity, the Egyptian and Norse deities, to how the show addressed uh, Christianity as mythos. Well, you know, the the initial seasons when they're taking with off from the movie, uh, they're really dealing with uh, some of the 18th century scholar or 1800 scholarship where. Um, there must be an eponymous, some person that, that all of this is based on, that this has come from. Um, third season, you get demons where uh, somebody says, well, the Gua'uld could never take on the role of the Christian deity or the Jewish deities because those are too benevolent. That wouldn't fit. So then we see that Sokar is taking on the role of Lucifer um, as he's used the Antarctic Gate to take some folks um, from the medieval period and move them to another planet. They're very careful. They didn't say that he was who Lucifer was based upon. So, he took on the role of Lucifer. Right. That was a nice turn of a phrase to not offend anyone. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, if you look at it, they, in the show, they, they did that quite often um, with the ancient deities. They took on the role. Sometimes it, it kind of got brushed over, but there are a few times where they did make a point of saying took on the role of uh, Apophis or took on the role of fill in the blank. Uh, as you get into the Ori, though, I think because Battlestar Galactica had been so successful and I think really demons laid the groundwork for where they really wanted to go with a critique of contemporary religion, they, um, they really started playing out what happens when your God is so important to you that you decide that you have to force people to believe it. And it very much was, even though... Battlestar Galactica really was dealing with 9-11 and, and the later seasons of Stargate were dealing with the issues raised by 9-11. Very much was about the Crusades. Um, you know, the, the architecture um, in Celestis, the, the paintings were like illuminated manuscripts and Vala's walking around carrying an apple, uh, which incidentally the Bible actually doesn't in the Hebrew, it isn't apple. It actually is a fruit we can't identify. So that's even interpretation that's put later um, based on, I think, the Latin translation. But, you know, there's, there's all these subtle hints that we're talking about, not necessarily Islam, but we are talking about Christianity. We are talking about, um, even in Judaism, in the Maccabean period, there was a forced conversions of the, the people across the Jordan River. So all of these major Western world religions had some history to greater or lesser extent of forcing folks to get on board um, with their God. I, I have an interesting question. You brought the Maccabees. Um, how would, what historical group would you compare the Tokra to? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know that I really would, I mean, in the sense that they're a spinoff, um, you know, they're, they're disagreeing with the philosophy. Um, 
If, if I, I mean, could, if, just see if this, how this how this works. What if they are a little bit more like the Hellenic Greeks? Because in the, the way that I'm seeing that is that they want to live in partnership, and you had like the gods interacting on a mortal level with men, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And that's kind of the way that Tokra and human host partnership is. That's about the best that I can come up with. And I know that you probably can come up with yeah. more. Uh, and, and that's interesting because they, they wanted to be in partnership with the people who would let them live in their bodies, but they were often very resistant to joining with the earth and the Jaffa resistance. There, right. there was a lot of distrust there uh, in, in several episodes. There's one where they think, oh, well, who killed this person? Did this person kill, you know, what group killed this person on this planet? And you mm -hmm. find out it wasn't really the Tokra or the Jaffa or. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if you think maybe there's sort of a, a metaphor for splinterings of different sets of religions? Mm -hmm. The first thing I thought of were the different you know, types of Jews and how they moved throughout you know, the Middle East and Europe, and then different branches of Christianity, the Gnostics, you know, and the, the, the Great Schism and things. Do you think it could sort of be an overarching metaphor for that? Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, just in general, cultures disagree and divide over issues, yeah, and there's schisms, and there's in religion, and in countries, and yeah, that could be. Well, Let's compare and contrast the Egyptian gods with the uh, with the Ori. Uh, I believe one would be orthodoxic and one be, would be orthopraxic. Say more. Well, <laughs> in, in, in Rome, the sheer fact that you acted out the religion and that you went through with the ceremony meant more than believing. So in many ways, though the Jaffa truly worshipped the gods, those who uh, were their supplicants, uh, it meant more that they followed the orders than, than you had to believe in them. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the Ori, where you had to believe in them. Because uh, your belief in them actually gave them power. And it's interesting, uh, and, and um, uh, a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, we, we thought that we... In, in string theory, whenever you saw two particles and and you would be able to derive energy from them uh, by the the probability of the two particles eventually hitting, uh, that you could actually derive energy from that. It, at the last three weeks, peer review actually said that there's more energy put in to us thinking about and observing it than the potential between the two. That thought and potential energy is very possibly the same thought and, and observation that gave the Ori their power, because we had to worship and think about them to, for them to feed. Yes, but they also point out the limits of the power. Um, and I think it's in the episode Origin where you've got, um, you've got there um, your first view of, of, of people who are openly, or not openly rebelling, but they're rebelling, they're looking for artifacts, they're hiding the ancient artifacts, they're heretical because they believe their history starts before the Book of Origin. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, I think it is, makes the comment that um, they're not powerful enough that they can identify the people who don't believe. Um, they they do gain power from everyone, and of course it transfers to Adria when they're all gone. But they're not so powerful that unless they catch you red-handed, uh, that they can identify that you're you're not a believer. I, I was referring to their their power itself as it's rather how they are worshipped. Mm -hmm. So the fact that carrying out the worship of the Egyptian gods was respecting their power meant more than actually worshiping them. Actually, worshiping the Ori meant was the source, was the source of the power. Mm -hmm. The so, six hours of prostration so a day. So, quite ironically, it would be the uh, the Egyptian gods were worshipped in a more uh, Roman and very logically, uh, perhaps I I'm incorrect, Egyptian sense, where carrying out the actions of the worship and of the ceremony meant more than actually worshipping the deity at times, as opposed to uh, the Christian concepts where you must worship the deity and loving God alone is the, 
the basis of a great deal of Christian faith. It's it's a claim of Christian faith, mm-hmm. but it's it's something that, and we see this in in how the choirs act, and you know, you better be at prostration, and you better you know say the blessing correctly, or Vala is going to be tied in the middle of the town and, and burned. Um, you know, there still is very much that overlay of ritual where whether or not that may not be where the power comes from, but the trappings are there where if you aren't outwardly doing these rituals, um, you will be put to death. So theirs is more of a combination of the two. Yes, I would say that. Yeah, it would be. that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, because you've got the humans who are enforcing the ritual. Um, and to an extent, the Jaffa enforce the ritual on each other as well, I think, with um, with the uh, Gu'ol. So, uh, what made me think about this was when you brought up the Maccabees, it, it made me think of the, uh, the compare and contrast, because the story of the Maccabees. Uh, where it's like you are not going to do the, uh, you're not going to do these rituals in our temple. We are going to revolt. Uh, we are not going to outwardly give our allegiance to the Seleucid or whoever happens to be in charge of Palestine at the time. Um, and while they, they didn't truly care if they worshipped the Seleucids or whoever, and, and whatever Gideon or deity, they just wanted them to do it because to show the power. That, that's a great thought. Uh, they, they want the Seleucids, yes, it was do it, show the power, but the problem on the side of the Maccabees and the, because is they because they both sides. Right. You know, you're not going to have us, you know. Worship God, your God, your your deity, your deified emperor in our God's temple. We're not going to do that. We're not going to eat pork. We're not going to not circumcise ourselves. The outward signs are important to the Maccabees as well. Absolutely fantastic. I'm so glad you're on this panel. This, this is great. <laughs> this, this, this is fantastic. I know. This is like... Did Jennifer put you on this panel, or did you request? No, I, I was I was nosy, and I messaged Jamie, and I said, I want to do this. High five. Yes. Which is what I did at Time Gate. I said, I'm an archaeologist. Can I do this? Oh. Sure. <laughs> oh, we have to do panels together at Time Gate. This is, this is awesome. Oh, this is cool. Um, okay. I, have, I have a question. I have a, <laughs> I have a question. I'm having a great time. time. You. But um, one, of, one of the my favorite commentaries is in Origin Part 2, when Daniel is describing to Vala the significance of the iconography of fire mm-hmm. and talks about yeah. how, how fire changes back and forth. Um, your thoughts in general about, you know, his explanation of that and its relationship to Christianity and Christian faith? Maybe? I mean, there's... Mm, uh, it's it's sort of okay. Uh, I mean, in Zoroastrian tradition, where's, where we get basically the concept of hell because prior to that, in... In ancient Israelite religion and in Judaism, it, I mean, it, it's Sheol. Um, it's, it's, this, it's just a place where everybody goes. It's a, you know, you're a shadowy existence. And there's a story in 1 Samuel 28 where, um, where uh, Saul calls up the prophet Samuel from Sheol. And, you know, they just everybody's down there hanging out. Um, and so fire as this evil thing um, fire is a part of the Zoroastrian tradition so when um, when folks you know go into exile that's how it becomes a part of Judaism and Christianity um, but I mean th- whether or not it's evil is is not really there's there's no that's not really a function until it it becomes mixed in with Judaism and Christianity, more so Christianity and less Judaism. You're, you're yeah. really going to have to fill them in on some of the, the uh, basic tenets of Zor- Zoroastrianism, so the whole conversation makes more sense. I mean, Zoroastrianism, you know, uh, oh, lousy mercy, that's not really my area, but I mean, beyond knowing how the fire, um, I mean, they believed you should, um, you should, uh, do cremation. Um, there is um, at the, you leave the body out also to deteriorate. Um, there's two deities that are equally evil that's, and that's what I, I and, and right. good. Yes. Uh, so that I guess you could look at that as the Ori versus the ancients. Um, yeah, the idea of light and dark, two diametrically opposed deities of equal power, really 
<laughs> it may not have had its origin there, but that's when it became popular. Yeah, and yeah, and you know when it, the the translation of into English that says the three wise men, it's, no, it's it's three Zoroastrian priests actually are traveling to visit the baby Jesus. Um, you know, we there's definitely some cleaned up aspects of, of translations. Yes, you are going crazy. You really want to say something because you know a lot about this stuff too. Yeah, um, I think that the. The Pori fire predates the Christianity and Zoroastrian. When Daniel discussed that, he said in the beginning of the civilization, we were worshiping fire, fire sticks, uh, and then suddenly it changed at some point. And it's true, because in the beginning, a lot of a religious, primal religion, were based around the heart of the, of the house, of the, the, the fire itself. If I can spin on your idea there, I was going to go back a little further, and this may be a bad translation, and so I'll, I'll bow to your scholarly knowledge on it, but we have the uh, Garden of Eden, when, when, when the Adam and Eve are kicked out, and the angel guards with a sword of fire, and then there's the burnt offerings, and, and the fire cleanses. And, and that sort of thing. It's, it's something about, you know, cleansing yourself of sin and it involves using fire as a tool to accomplish that. Those images, are those all bad translations? No, no, th those are, those images of, of devoting something to God and, and the, the sort of fire, I don't think that's really about good or bad. That's just a way of, you know, that, I can't even remember the date of that story, but, um, you know, I think this this notion of of fire becomes bad is later in tradition and this is where where the show itself is starting to mix different periods of religion together um you know yes the ori predates christianity but in the world of the show what they're saying is somewhere later down the line the ancients have put this fear of fire but you know, that would have to way predate Christianity and Judaism uh, to the point of, you know, what, fire okay. sticks there would be. Right. So to, to what, the point of agriculture, then we start fearing the fire. One thing we got to remember, though, is that uh, the writers of the show and those watching don't very, know. Very don't know. They don't know about the aboriginal origins of yeah. these religions. They think of the pop cultural concept of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And most people in Christianity and outside of Christianity generally think of a very odd, watered-down Protestant view of Christianity whenever you think of generic Christianity. Uh, I remember uh, someone once saying that all Catholics, what they, everything a Catholic knows is about what a fifth grade Protestant child knows. Everything they know is slightly, they know, they know very little and what they know is Protestant because that's what's, mm -hmm. what's easy, it's easy to grasp. And it's what's on television. Yeah. I mean, that's what, when, when, when you watch TV and you see, let's say a soap opera, for instance, it's always a Protestant. Mm -hmm. When somebody dies, it's a Protestant ceremony. It's just what Hollywood does, is Protestant Christianity. They love it. Because whenever you bring up Catholicism, it, it's, I, I said this earlier in another conversation, anything good or bad you want to say about Catholicism, you can, because it's 2,000 years old. On the other hand, this ambiguous, uh, it's so all-inclusive because there's so many takes on Christianity and Protestantism, is that you can walk away with just saying, love Jesus, and, <laughs> and you're about 95% right. And Hollywood can grasp onto that, that there's a hell where fire's at, Jesus lives up in the clouds, and you're supposed to love him. That's the extent of the popular idea of Christianity. Yes, there's a whole lot more there, but when you really water it down, that's the accessible way to view Christianity. Well, and the other way of portraying Christianity that's popular in Hollywood is that we're all fundamentalist evangelical Christians that hate everything that's different, which is not a real view of Christianity either. I mean, no, no view of Christianity is portrayed by Hollywood is actually it it's it's one manifestation it's like you pointed out there are a lot of judaism there are a lot of christianities there are lots of every religion there's no one monolithic way of viewing the tradition but hollywood 
or any art form can't really get to that in a one hour show or a season but, or whatever. But what makes the show accessible and very successful is that it uses stereotypes. If it didn't, you couldn't watch it. If they spent so much time discussing all of the, but, but this is different, but this is different, they couldn't make a show. They have to pull on some basic stereotypes, basic intellectual schemas to pull on or else you can't watch it. Right. Um, I, I've said this on other panels before, this is why I believe Stargate Universe fails, is because they try to address the multifaceted nature of everything to the point where nothing happens. There was no plot because they were so busy bickering on a spaceship showing how diverse everyone was that they couldn't get to the science fiction. So whenever we have space aliens, it's really easy to say like, Egyptian gods were violent. Christ, uh, the, this Christian-like deity, like, well, there's, there's fire and there's heaven. It, okay, done. Let's go on to the story. Let's get to it. If they spent all the time talking about all the variations and all the differences, one, we wouldn't care. Second, we'd be bored. Third, we wouldn't get it. So they did it for the sake of story. They didn't do it that, uh, so that in 30 years someone's writing their thesis on this, even though I'm sure someone has. <laughs> or they will. Or, yeah. It's coming. Yes. So it, it wasn't designed to, to be, to have someone of your caliber discussing it at, at such a great extent. It was designed to entertain. It was designed to entertain, but yeah. what it does say, from, from our perspective, these two friends of mine over here do ethics, um, from our perspective, what's interesting is what it does say about us mm. and what yes. we want to be entertained by, what what um, what we create, um, how we want to interpret the possibilities of life. That's why scholars are interested in science fiction. Well, everything we do, everything we perceive and are entertained by, perception is always selective. We choose to actually what what we want to see. We have the choice of turning off the TV. The fact we didn't turn off the TV, what does that say about us? What did we choose to perceive? Is that what you're... Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to go back a little bit, this may be slightly off, but um, you were asking about the Tok'ra, and I'm just wondering if it isn't... The thing that comes to mind for me is a Vudan perspective, which is sort of in between... Uh, between what's, what perspective? Voodoo, Okay. In which the idea is that you are kind of equal or slight, the gods are slightly above you, but there's like an arguing reciprocal relationship and they can't exist without you letting them. You horse them, you invite them into you, they're in your body, and then they kind of can take over at any time. But there's a negotiation and there's a discussion, and it may be that the writers have no knowledge of this whatsoever, but it seems very... And that was great, fun. actually. That, that, that's the best answer I've had heard of that. What do you think? I, I would you know I would be willing willing to bet that the writers had no concept right. of yeah. that, but that's where the beauty of us watching the show comes in. That's where your interaction is and how you perceive it, as as he was saying a second ago. Um, you know, probably if they even had a conception of Voodoo Vudan, it would have been a Gua'uld. It would have been in that phase of the show. Um, because that's when they tended to do that kind of thing. Um, but there's room, I think. That yeah, there's room. There's definitely room. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, the three monolithic religions. There is room for the Norse. There is room for the pagans. There is room for the Vedas. There's room for all of that. And I think that's what's so wonderful in the way the gods are portrayed is that universal element that goes across all cultures. Well, the more we talk about Gnostics, who is, who is, who is also believe that the spirit is coming upon you while you're praying, and the spirit is is like it's a, it's the idea of Gnostics was that you are having secret knowledge. There's the secret, secret knowledge. knowledge. That's and more the like the ancients. Yeah, and secret mm -hmm. knowledge will, will 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 get to you if you will do certain rituals mm -hmm. and certain way you will pray to the God and certain way you will, you will write the symbols. Mm -hmm. So this is more like, all right, I'm, I'm thinking, because if you will do the certain things, prostrate for six hours a day, go down and do the, 
the, the, the read the book of the origin again going back to the reading the Torah reading the, the, mm -hmm. the, the writings you would get the secret knowledge which only chosen ones will receive and the chosen one usually was the priest or like the leader of the Gnostic group and the chosen one was apostle which, which received the Shina um, you, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, yeah. Let's make sure we get, get yeah. more people in the conversation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, this is sort of what I'm getting from this, and I just want to know if this is right. Um, you, know, you mentioned Wudong, which is, you know, unless you live in Louisiana or know about you know African religions or whatever, you're not going to know about that. However, you know, you're mentioning all these very kind of esoteric things, mm -hmm. but yet you're also mentioning the watering down, and, and I couldn't help but think about how those big monolithic religions take from all those smaller ones. You know, the concept yeah. of yeah. Esther. Yes. Christmas. Know, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I sort of feel like the show is a parallel of how we've adopted these smaller mm -hmm. religions and, and ceremonies into the big, big ones, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of seeing that reflection mm -hmm. where you've got sort of these big groups in the Stargate universe, but yet you've got all these little takes from other that's very but, good. Yeah, that is, that that is, is a very good observation. Very good. Yeah, I mean, that's like the Greeks called it imitation, yeah. um, mimesis, and that's exactly what it is. And that's what we do as humans: we take things and we re oh, we appropriate yeah. it and and make it something new yet the same. Because yeah. you mentioned that the writers don't know this; right. they may not know where it comes from. But they've they gotten something it. of it from yeah. something, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah. And they have to do something familiar, or else it won't work. Yeah, which means it's universal. What's also interesting is that the more we talk about the show and we discuss it, we, by our interaction with the show, we alter and change its meaning. So the fact that we're sitting here discussing it, from now on, when all of us watch the show, we've altered the meaning of the show by having this conversation. Mm -hmm. so, so, it's called reader response. Yeah. But, but it's a wonderful thing. It means that the show is alive. It's off the air, but we are keeping it alive and active and dynamic by still keeping it alive and active and dynamic. Right here. Yes. Along those lines of interaction, it makes yes. me think of, um, I have some very cynical friends who they keep insisting that mythology is dead. Well, I'm all <laughs> sitting in this room, and there's thousands of people out there at this con, so I'd say that it's not dead. But what do you think about the idea? Mythology is dead? Mythology is religion. <laughs> Mythology, <laughs> mythology is saying, somebody else's religion. What does that even mean? Did, did yeah. a professor say that in college and they repeated it? I mean, what is that? I completely disagree, and I am an anthropology student, and there's an idea that a lot of anthropologists and media scholars have that our, our popular media, our TV shows and films, constitute a large amount of our of course. And our rituals. And I was wondering if you had comments on that? Or? By coming here, this is a it, this is a spiritual <laughs> pilgrimage for people. This yes. is the, this oh, is yeah. I mean we're an acting transformational energy pilgrimage. The one oh. that, that would uh, uh, my friend Scott he, he's a uh, archaeologist and we, this, this area was myth and we often discuss that the the largest mythos that we probably have as a culture would be superheroes. Because nothing quite permeates and gives us moral lessons like Captain America, like Superman, like Batman. The, this this is the most popular mythos I believe we have currently. Those are the the deities that are strong, that fight amongst each other, that meet the mortals. The, that that would probably be the primary mythos. We this is a mystery cult that we're in right now. This is some strange offshoot that is not the main myth of probably superheroes. Well, and to kind of go back to a panel that we had a couple days ago, we were talking about um, science and the Asgard and things like that, and one of the things that we came, that came out of that is that our contentment level with what we have, the newest shiny, is diminishing the length of time it lasts and is fresh and cool to us, is growing shorter. You, it, you, because it took so long to communicate ideas back and forth at one point, 
you know, you would buy a new dress in the 1700s, for example, and you would write to your cousin in France about it, and it was 400 miles by horse, and so it would take four months for the letter to get there. Well, now we can send that same message in instant. And so now people have time to exchange that many messages about something, and then it's not the new thing anymore. It's not the new thing anymore much faster. And, this so, actually, uh, and so we're not, not as satisfied with it. So in the sense that you say mythology is dead, Part of it is that it's maybe in some ways it's going through its evolutionary process a whole lot faster and sometimes we <laughs> miss things. It's like the newest meme on the internet. Whenever you miss it and you come back to it three weeks later, everyone makes fun of you because God, that's so over. That's so like last week, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Grumpy cat, duh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this actually brings up a, a pet peeve of mine that I hear in popular culture often is that we believe it's incredible arrogance, it's hubris that History now moves faster. Have you heard people say this? Yes. Mm -hmm. History now moves faster. It doesn't move faster. It doesn't. It more just stuff scrolls happens. faster on the bottom of it the screen. Scrolls, no, there's more information, but there's a lot of information that we just didn't know it. If you want a great example of history not moving faster, compare what I'm wearing to someone in 1890. It doesn't move that fast. Compare, uh, there, are, there aren't 30 minute wars. There, there are, uh, the revolutions come and go, but they don't happen faster because we have the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, we under see it happening. Things were constantly happening in the past. There are always personal relationships evolving and devolving. There were kings being overthrown constantly, but not everyone didn't know. So what we have are leftover accounts, which makes it look like only huge things happened in history. Now we're aware of so much. History is moving faster. No, it's not. Our perception of history has changed. So I, I know that's off topic, but it's one of my biggest pet peeves, and it's hubris whenever it is whenever you believe that you have the knowledge or power of the gods. It's hubristic to think because we have the internet that now our time and, and, and history moves at a faster pace than they did than it did 200 years ago. I'm sorry, this is not. No, we just have. This we just, just have. So badly when I hear it. We just have more perspectives. Right. It, we, everyone thinks they know everything now, um, mm -hmm. just because you can you can follow it. Yeah, the Cold War didn't happen any faster because of newspapers. Right. Mm -hmm. creates quicker. The, the, what? the transformation from the story to the legend to the mythos to the myth becomes more quick. Like we we in the past. It took time to get from the point where you had the fact, the legend, the myth. Um, now it's become, a, the, the time period becoming shorter. I disagree. During the time of George Washington, within his own lifetime, he was already a myth. They already had statues of him with the body of a god. He was a myth within his own time period, and there was no internet. I, I agree with that. I think I think more of the process you're thinking of would be canonization, yes. which is a whole other, what becomes the official myth, the authoritative mm -hmm. version of the myth. And I don't think it's easy to have that anymore because of the internet and people's ability to have a conversation about how many Judaisms <coughs> there are or whether myth is dead or it, there's there's just there's a way of transferring information that has changed that um, like I said I, I think it prevents the idea of an authoritative well I, I think part myth. of that to, to comment on that I think what happens is we access a mix of information both true false and just based on opinion we have so many sources that we don't value any single source more. And so the oh, legends don't as much. Oh, just ask my parents about Fox News. There's, <laughs> I know, there's but, one official source. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> but, but I think, do we see where I'm coming from with that? Is that, that as, a, as a people, as, pop, as a big group of people, it seems like we have so many sources of information. And we're always constantly trying. Actually, a lot of it, it's kind of like your email. You get so much more email now. And so much more that you don't look at because you don't value what it has to say. You're like, oh, that's going to be an ad. It's going to be jump, 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 jump. It's it, you get so much of it that you don't value. Right, and and hyperlink crazy. Right. You'll be in one paragraph and go, oh, something sparkle. Well, 
Well, we, we do have a canonization of at least time periods and movements because it's too hard to look at all of the levels of even the 80s. It's right. really quick to say the 80s are the time of greed. It's easy to say that. Now, working with that, let's move on. It's really easy to say the 60s had great music and lots of drugs. <laughs> on, on a popular notion, for most people, that's all that you think of immediately. Yes, of course, it, it was an incredibly dynamic period. We have tons of first-hand accounts. People are still alive from then. But we think that really quick. Right. So that's the myth of the time period. In the 70s, apparently, there's a surplus of the color brown. So, and marigold. And marigold. What was, and that? What, what was that? Oh my gosh! Like, like browns and oranges. Burnt what orange, was yeah. that? I mean, it was gorgeous. I love those colors. But seriously, like that's all I got. Out the drugs from the sixties. Yeah, <laughs> coming down from the drugs. But, but like in the nineties, like what happened in the nineties? Kurt Cobain. What else happened? Friends. Friends and Kurt Cobain. Stargate Buffy. Okay. <laughs> well, well, on a larger scale, it would be Kurt Cobain and, on a lesser extent, Friends. Like, like there's one thing that we remember, and that's the myth of the 90s. So we do have myth and, and slight canonization of time periods because right. yeah, we have true. to or else we can't comprehend time. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So flannel? Flannel. That's all that happened in the 90s, flannel. Grunge. And Grunge. That's all. You ever heard yeah. Smells Like Teen Spirit? You understand everything that happened for 10 years. <laughs> but then we get something, like if you want to step back to the 60s, then we get something like Mad Men that explodes that one yes. concept that we had of the 60s, and then all of a sudden my aunt says, I can't watch that and relive it because I was an oppressed woman in the 60s then. Um, you know, it, it does force us to look at the... The, and that's what science fiction does. It yeah, forces exactly. us to look at the minutia and think about it and explode the overriding myth that society tells us. Yeah, but whenever they traveled in time, even on Stargate, they had to use the cliches. Yeah. The Carthage Middle Left Turns, I just had a question that really wasn't directly related. Um, I was thinking about you talked about you know the, the hubris of history moving faster. And I was yes. thinking, one thing that my pet peeve is everyone's like, oh, the world is so dangerous, and don't let your kids outside. It's so much worse than it was in the 50s. Oh, yeah, right. we, we have more sex now than we did 50 years ago. Exactly. Even like, though what? Did we just discover it? And, you know, <laughs> they show something completely different when it comes to crime rates and birth rates and whatnot. Do you think that that is also arrogance, or do you think that is that ability to try to categorize and... and that, that information overload, that's our way of trying to... I, I think it's both. I think it's also the idea of everyone thinks a previous time period was better, and that's why we get songs like, give me some of that old-time religion, because obviously we, we worshipped God better 50 years ago. I like obviously that old-time rock and roll. Yeah, the old-time rock and roll. Rock and roll was better back in, like, the 50s. No, it wasn't. Like, at least in my opinion, like, like three chords, that's great. Um... But it's great to look back and go like, the best you got was Buddy Holly. Like, hey, he's good, but there's other good. But it's that old-time rock and roll. Give me some of that old-time religion. It was always, the grass was always greener then. I think that's what, what we may be experiencing. I was wondering, um, in talking about like, the dilution and the generalizations that we kind of have to make, but in many ways, for people who their world is maybe that narrow, I think shows like Stargate really kind of gave them permission to look at diversity in ways that they had it in like Precisely. You know, all of the Star Treks and all of that looking at whether it's racial diversity or sexual orientation or other religions or whatever. You know, my dad is a hardcore Catholic who only watches Fox News, but he is an early adopter and a techie. And I watched Star Trek on his lap growing up, and you know, so these shows, and he's amazingly more liberal than most of the people who swim in that pond. And I think mm -hmm. that yeah. science fiction did that for him. Yeah, not everybody's going to read Marx compared to Derrida and Foucault and wonder how it, it changed right. gender. Right. On the other hand, they'll watch. Uh, episode of uh, seasons of Stargate and go like, wow, Sam Jack, Sam, uh, she, she, uh, Sam, uh, she evolved. Apparently, gender's not just one thing. So they'll comprehend the fluidity of gender in that that way. So. The dummy down Foucault. That's what I'm saying. That's the name of it. The dummy down Foucault. The history of sexuality. <laughs> like Big Cliff Notes version. Stargate SG One. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my, my I'm down and dying. Uh, Stargate Atlantis. <laughs> 
<laughs> My comment on looking back. <laughs> when Tricot becomes funny. Tricot's all about Stargate now. There's nothing else. Grad school would make more sense. I was, I was going to say, uh, I know. My, my very surfacey kind of comment about, about old times being better and the past being better, there's one thing that's kind of a common thread about that complaint is that we continually have a bigger population and we continually have more information about what's going on. Um, the reason that not necessarily that we don't have more crime, but we certainly are more aware of the crime that does happen, that we yeah. have more people. And like our level of awareness of the bad stuff that's happening in the world has constantly increased from historical period to historical period. Yeah, what's disturbing is that Detroit has become as horrible as Robocop predicted. So we actually need a, a, a hypothetical cyborg in that city now. So uh, they, they lost almost complete control there. And science fiction predicted that disturbingly well. And uh, if someone had listened at the time, maybe things would be different. Maybe if people watched Stargate now and really took it to heart, we would predict, we would be able to prevent some horrible thing in the future. Like what? Like, we should yeah. like aligning, aligning ourselves with an alien race would make us sterile. <laughs> <laughs> don't blow a hole in the universe to try to draw power from another universe. <laughs> Yeah, we learned that three years ago, by the way, not aligning yourself with an alien race that gives you benevolence to, you know, cure cancer and stuff like that. That was three years ago. See, that episode was 2010, right? Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah whatever the... Uh, the Shen. Yeah, Shen. And then they encountered them in 2001. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, having driven through Michigan, okay, Detroit doesn't need, doesn't need Robocop. Detroit needs a nuclear weapon strike. In fact, multiple. I'd say start somewhere around the Ambassador Bridge and then end up in Ann Arbor and then call it a day. So, ethically though, how would you deal with killing all the people that live there? See, you know, if you the path, there's, you know, science the fiction pushes you to ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> would you, would you, would you blow up an Akron bomb? I mean, would you, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I'm would you destroy New York to get rid of If you follow the path of the, of the origin, you would know that's exactly correct. Well, that's, you know, yes, if you want to follow the origin. Yes. Could you bring it back to the religion? Yes. The most important, I had a discussion, but it was about religion. The most important phrase ever said in Stargate about religion was when the um, Tilk strapped to the gurney asks Menta why your God is better than mine. Because you can believe and I can't. So can you make a comment on that? I don't remember that episode, um, but I think you know yes. after after Origin um, at the end they discuss you know how can we have faith when all these gods that we've seen are not gods and you know Landry and Mitchell definitely I would say are the closest to being religious individuals that we see in terms of that conversation and they do leave room for faith and Mitchell says there we from what we've seen we know there can always be something that's even bigger than the ori or there's there's always room in the universe for one more level that we haven't discovered well, the show brings up an interesting moral dilemma that Star Trek often did is if Kirk lands on the planet and says, your Bible's alive, freak out and run around. <laughs> Did he do any good? Is, are you sure they weren't happier when they believed in a God and they had an answer to every question in their life had purpose? What happens to society when you take away that what compass? Like, let's make them as unhappy as we are. Uh, if everyone here if we said, why do we do things, and we had an answer, if there is an answer to every question, that's really comforting sounding. It's wrong according to everything we're told, but, but late at night when you think, why did my heart get broken, or why did my grandfather die, and there is an answer, who, like, is it correct that the SG team takes that away? 
people right. have an answer. Well, well, first off, I was just going to say, as far as the generalization, you know, that that's often a presumption that they make in Stargate, is, uh, which, especially in the beginning, they're a bit condescending. They go to a planet. Well, the people are clearly stupid and blind because they believe you know, their lives are very simple. Doesn't mean they don't actually have planet. Pl yeah. One of one of the things that happens, I'm just going to kind of, no, I and mean, we can get yes. this back no. in here. But one of the main things that influences their view of what the religion is on that is, first of all, Earth history, and second of all, the size of their weapons. And like, yeah. like yeah. you know, they they determine that the religion is primitive because the people are primitive because their weapons aren't as big as mine. And, and the other common thread is, you know, we come in with the case from Matsalo and Daniel first is it counters the concept. He doesn't look at it as, quote, an alien race. He considers it someone who's giving him mystical abilities. He's totally fine with it because she's giving him the power to strike people did. Uh, had Oma Salah been introduced as an adversarial entity, then very quickly the, the look behind the curtain would be very important because, uh, and it works in the political society we live in right now, I don't like you or I think you, you're doing something wrong, so I'm going to quickly demonize you and tell your people that it's the wrong political, the wrong social, the wrong religious uh, belief set so that then I don't have to deal with you as a problem. Well, and, but, but that's similar to what Daniel does when he encounters the Ori. I mean, he stops and he says, did the Ori really tell you to do this or did you make up a system interpreting the Ori telling you yeah. to do this? Yeah. And that's that point that Vala raises uh, when her husband is reading to her after she's very much the Virgin Mary, um, or while she's the Virgin Mary, but uh, her husband's telling like her how she's Virgin served Mary. the or right. <laughs> and so she's, yeah, very hot. Um, or or she, the mother of Anakin, according to Teal. <laughs> she has him read the Book of Origin, and she says, where in the book is it saying, burn all these people? Uh, it's in here somewhere, so you need to, you know, and so that's another major point is that people... Quickly, if they didn't use generalizations, first off, they'd end up alienating massive amounts of fan base because if they used a specific religion and attacked it very accurately, uh, whether you agree with it or not, it would clearly offend a, a fan base. So See, to me, that clearly attacks people that have a very narrow view of Christianity and Islam. I mean, it can apply to any religion where you know more about what you've been told to believe than what's... Like. It's like people who know more about what Left Behind says than what the Book of Revelation says. And they say, call it Revelations, which it's actually not. Multiple times. Multiple times. Multiple times. You ethics, you know, are these people's lives better? And I'm sort of thinking of, you know, more of the planet of the week kind of episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it depends on the different planets. You know, if you look at our history, Africa and, you know, America, they really weren't better off after, you know, the more advanced people came and told them that their religions were false, they had, you know, the more advanced weapons. Um, but I think. With the Stargate universe, you'd almost have to take it world by world. Mm -hmm. You know, and this one, it might have ended up better later. This one, it didn't. So I don't know that there really could be an answer well, it's to an your question. It's an imperialistic view, in a way, because uh, the Romans made the world safe for the Roman culture. Uh, the, the United States makes the world safe for capitalism. Uh, on SG-1, we make the universe safe for Western philosophy. So, thank goodness we can spread Western philosophy. That's essentially what we do. The SG team gets out and says, this is Western philosophy, this is what we believe is right and wrong, you're welcome. <laughs> um, actually, I kind of have a question, and um, it was leading back to something Jan was talking about earlier, was uh, talking about the prescribed rituals needed to follow the ori, and the, the access to the secret knowledge. Um, I really like the discussions about the Ori versus the ancients, the Alter Alterans, about how the very fact, I, mean, I think it's, uh, there was, um, I don't remember his name, it was, it was a descended uh, ancient who came down and gave knowledge to Samantha about how um, that path would not work. Have just Orin, right? Orin, 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 yes. Okay? Orin. Yeah. Um, Orin says the very fact that they lay out a plan for how to ascend is the biggest part of the problem is that this is supposed to be something that you determine for yourself and it's a very and you know it's a very self-seeking and finding journey and uh, you know it just kind of happens and there's not one way to do it and the very fact that they said there's this one way to do it with all these details that you have to follow to get the access to the secret power that's what makes that religion not work um thoughts ideas about but, how they but hold on but it doesn't work it, it seemed to work for a lot of people uh, it's worked for McKay. Yeah, it, it, we're just 
it, like their religion doesn't work. Like that's the problem. We're viewing it from our lens. It's we can't help it. We're trapped. We're trapped in this totalizing schema. I said that for you. Yeah, we're trapped. Yeah, we're screwed. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> you know, I. But they were very. They weren't consistent with that. They also said, yeah. oh, if there's a massive amount of power, you can ascend an entire planet's worth of people. So is it a power-based thing, or is it a schema of rituals and things that you follow when you center yourself? And, well, Oma can help Daniel, but Adria doesn't need any help. They, I really don't feel like they ever actually landed on a way to ascend, which actually means there are many ways to ascend, I guess. Plus, no. there are many paths to one God. Plus, we have no proof ascending is that good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very frustrating. Yeah. It's like, shoot. <laughs> like, what, 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 I can't do anything it, now. Yeah. Well, 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 whenever you come back, you don't remember anything about it. So this thing that happens, how do we know it's so awesome? It's like... Our it's a coffee shop. That's all we know. It's Daniel sitting in a, in a Waffle House. Yeah. yeah. Okay. On the but, back statement, um, Oma actually said Daniel did that to himself. It was his choice. He could have remembered if he wished. In the, in the coffee shop, Oma said... She oh, that's right. She does say, you made that choice. Yeah. He chose not and, to remember. And, or, and Oren does remember, So, but that was, yeah, I mean, that was because of the way that Does he ever was. say that it was that awesome? Like, dude, you won't believe it. Like, man, there's <laughs> plasma TVs everywhere. <laughs> I think the only thing Daniel ever says is, I thought I knew a lot, and ascending is just the first step. Right. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's, it reminds me a lot of, um, on, on Babylon 5, anybody watch that? Yeah, when they went beyond the rim. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's our ultimate goal, beyond the rim. Well, that sounds like a boundary that I go past. Well, what's past there? That's Star Trek when we encounter what's what's it's, what's the brother's name? You go beyond the edge. What was the brother's name, Roger? Spock's brother. When he, yeah. Yeah. So, so is that is that the the ultimate or is it the penultimate? Um, it isn't one of the definitions of God is that think of the absolute most amazing, most wonderful thing you can think of. It's one better. It, well, what is that most amazing thing that I can't comprehend? Is ascension that? I don't know. And is it worthwhile doing? Well, I might be happier now. Once you can comprehend it, it seems like it's no longer that. You know, it's like if you if you reach that state of, of the secret power. Once you have that the you secret can't power, use. it's no longer yeah. secret yeah, you can't anymore. Use it. Then there, that, is there another thing that I didn't know about even existing before that I can now conceive of but can't attain, and now I have to work toward that? Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it could be, it could, there could be more. Well, maybe we, that's uh, the more Landry mentions, or the truth is that. Well, we have about three minutes left. I, I'm going to ask for uh, final comments from actually the the panelists, gentlemen. Uh, the, you've had a question for a while, sir. I was just thinking. You know, from what y'all said, could it be that whole concept of the whole argument of ascension is a discussion of the whole concept of heaven? You know, is it really all that? You know, mm -hmm. uh, as a kid, Precisely. I grew up in a fundamentalist religion, and so I looked I, at the, that religion's concept of heaven and realized that I'd be bored to tears there. Yeah, South, the South Park would so be the same thing. Job is, you know, if Daniel refused to remember ascension because it really wasn't all that. I think he really doesn't think it was all that. And I think that's because he wants to fix and heal and make things better and make everybody happy. And here he's in this situation where he has the power that he could absolutely create utopia. And he can't do it because they'll send him back to our plane of existence. And that is his ultimate choice. I mean, I have that same thing. I mean, I was raised in a Southern Baptist household. My issue is... Why is dying in eternal life a comfort? Because I, I guess I've never gotten the idea of why eternity is so appealing. Well, why that? And I, I just have never understood that. Well, we have two minutes left, so what is your final comment on the panel? Well, what would you like to leave these folks with? Um, I leave you with, it is all about your perception and your interaction with it. And that religion, mythology, it's ever 
evolving. I guess that's what I would. And is there any uh, way that uh, the people that enjoy this fantastic conversation can follow you online or uh, read anything that you've written? Uh, I am going to write this up for Space Gypsies. Uh, so I yeah. guess I'd be, I don't have a blog what? presence per se. What I've, is Space Gypsies? Uh, it is a geeky girl website, uh, but any of you can follow Space Gypsies. I think several panels were being written up. There were going to be some interviews from some other other writers uh, covering con and various other nerdy, geeky. We can argue about that. That's a panel. Geek versus nerd. What does it mean? <laughs> does that definition change? Is there a mythos for it? There's already been a statistical study of it by, based on words. And, and, Which um, I'm like, why are those were? Yeah, I have a problem with that statistical study. <laughs> I have a problem with everything. And what would you uh, like to leave people with, and uh, and and a little bit more about yourself? I think that the if if uh, we look at sci-fi, one of the things that we can't do if we're going to engage it at a humane level with humanitarianism, with secularism at all, if you're going to do that, you can't ignore religion for the sake of not causing conflict. Yeah. I yeah. Think it's, Everything is up to critique. I, I think be. that Stargate, especially Stargate SG-1, has so much religious context built into it that to ignore that part of it is depriving yourself of part of